In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. So if you catch the train from Central Station in Sydney, and you go to the last train stop, and then you get on the bus, and you go to the last bus stop, and you walk to the end of the footpath, that's my house. <laughs> that's my house where I grew up as a kid. Um, When people first start coming to the Latin Mass, they, they get uh, interested in where did it come from, why is it, um, why was it taken away, all these sorts of things, and, and you start looking around. So there's all sorts of stuff on the internet about the Latin Mass and the last hundred years of the church. Some of it is written by people who know what they're talking about, some of it's not, some of it's good, some of it's not. Some of it's theology, some of it's made up. Some of it is written by people who lived through that time, and their story is, is often one of everything that was taken off us and the abuses in the liturgy and so on. My story is a little different, and I've never actually told my story that I can think of. So you know me, and you know that I love celebrating the Latin Mass, uh, you know that I've been with the Latin Mass pretty much all my life. <clears throat> so today I'm going to tell you kind of how it all went, at least from, from my side of the story. I'm kind of like a second generation, so I didn't live through the council. Um, now I guess we could say there's like a third and a fourth generation of people who go to the Latin Mass. So mine is kind of like what happened after everything was taken away. My first memories were from my mother being sacristan at a new parish that was being established in my suburb, which was, like I said, at the end of Sydney. So, of course, being at the end of Sydney, they needed a Catholic church. And this was just a regular church, the New Rite Mass, and we would have a priest that would come out and we would set up chairs in the hall at the um, public school and uh, I remember very clearly my mother used to be the one that would set all this up and then we would all go to mass there and uh, I guess they say that your childhood kind of forms you so ever since then I've been starting churches but um, that was my first experience and so when I was very young about five or six years old my mother told me that we were going to go to a special church with a special Mass, and that it was going to be very, very far away. So this Mass was in Wagga Wagga. It was very far away. In the outback, there's a town called, um, uh, what's it called, Gundagai. A town called Gundagai in the outback. And, and for people that live in Sydney, Gundagai is like way, way out there. There are songs about Gundagai. There's the dog that sits on the taco box five miles from Gundagai. There's the old-fashioned Ford on the road to Gundagai. So there's songs about Gundagai. So we were driving and we, we saw the dog on the taco box. And we got out and we looked at the dog on the taco box and then we kept driving. We went way past Gundagai out to Wagga Wagga, and we get there after hours and hours and hours of driving. And we get out, and, and it's a barn. And I'm like, wait a minute. You told me this is going to be some sort of fantastic church. And it was a barn. And, and it was full of all these people that had driven about as far as we did. Um, and there was this old priest. I don't even remember who the priest was. I just remember that he celebrated Mass. I was only five years old, six years old, something like that, so I only remember one thing, well, I remember the distance, 
But beyond the distance, I only remember one thing about that mass, and that was there was like this, this amazing innovation of this rail around the altar. And at communion time, everybody would come up and they would kneel around this rail. And I was thinking how awesome this was because like the priest really kept moving. He could like keep giving communion to like a ton of people uh, instead of having to wait in line one by one. And um, that was my first impression. So beyond that, it was fun to see the dog on the tucker box. I'd heard about that and we went home. And um, my childhood continued. There were a few old priests that would celebrate the Latin Mass in Sydney. There were two, actually. Uh, there was Father Fox and there was Father Hogan, Father Terence Hogan. Um, so when Pope Paul VI changed the Mass from Latin to, to English or to the vernacular, he kind of left the Latin part open-ended he never actually said, okay, we're stopping this Mass and we're starting this Mass. Now, for all intended purposes, every bishop was saying, no, we've stopped this and you have to start this. Uh, but it, it was kind of open-ended. And then about a year later in 1971, so the Mass kind of started at the beginning of the liturgical year in 1970. In 1971, there was this indult known as the Agatha Christie indult. And it was a it was a request written to the Pope to ask the Pope that for historical reasons, if he would allow the occasional celebration of the Old Mass. And it was signed by a ton of people, celebrities, theologians, Catholics, non-Catholics. And the Pope is looking at this letter, the story goes, he's looking at this letter and he's reading all these signatures and then he says, ah, Agatha Christie, yes, we'll do this. And he signed it because apparently he liked the books of Agatha Christie. So he signed this, and because of this indult, uh, many priests would go to their bishops and they would say, you know, I'm too old to learn how to relearn the entire Mass. I can't learn the new Mass. Can I just continue saying the Mass that I, that I know, the Latin Mass? And the bishops, usually these priests were retired, um, and the bishop really didn't care anymore because they weren't actually in a parish. And so the bishop would say, yeah, sure, just keep on doing what you're doing there. And so, so that's who Father Fox was, and that's who Father Terence Hogan was. They were, they were really old priests. So Father Fox was allowed to do the Latin Mass, but he wasn't allowed to preach. So he would read a book instead. Um, <laughs> I remember there was one Christmas that my aunt got really mad because he had read from this book for a very long time and she wanted to get back home and start cooking Christmas dinner and she was saying well he's not even allowed to preach anyway so why is he taking so long on Christmas day but anyway so these old priests they, they would celebrate the mass and, and it was usually in a hall or, or, or somewhere it wasn't really in a church at all and then some young priests came to town they were the Society of St. Pius X. And uh, we, we would go to their Mass. We would get off at Stanmore and we would take the train. We didn't have a car in our family because most people in Sydney, they get around with public transportation anyway. So we would take the train and get off at Stanmore. And it would be Mass in their house. Like they had like a little house near the train station and we would do Mass where the priest lived. Anyway, so that was, that was going on, and my sister surprised us all. My sister had been working at the bank and uh, learning Spanish. It's kind of weird. I mean, <laughs> here everybody speaks Spanish, but in Australia nobody speaks Spanish. And so it's like, this is kind of weird. Um, and then one day she surprises us, and she's going to be a nun. And she had done her research all, the, the parameter that she was looking for is that she wanted to go to a convent where they wore the habit. And she would ask this convent and that convent, and, and none of them would wear their habits. Or they would wear their habits, and then they would take it off for recreation. But then she finally found one where they wore the habit all the time, and it was in Mexico. So she 
announced to our family that she was going to Mexico to, to be a nun. And then in the conversation, I came out that there was also a, a masculine branch as well as the nuns. So the nuns were in one monastery and there were brothers and priests in another monastery. So my brother was just like, yeah, I'll go try it out too. And, <laughs> and, as, he, and as he finishes that line, he says he's been trying it out ever since. <laughs> So they both took off, and it was just um, just my mother and me. And um, the, the young priests from the SSPX, they ended up getting a little church on the other side of town. It was about 50 miles away from where my house was. And they, they got a little school. By little school, I mean little school, like three people in each grade, <laughs> primary school. Um, so that was kind of my home away from home. We were there every day. And again, so no car, uh, public transportation. We would catch the 7.27 a.m. Tra uh, train, which means we had to catch the bus before that. And um, we would get there at 9 o'clock for school and then leave at 3 and get back at 6, 6.30-ish. Um, so when they say about walking to school uphill both ways, that, that's kind of how it was for me, but like really, it really was. Um, and so we're talking peak hour tra uh, train, and so there's no seats available. And um, we were taught manners when I was a kid, and so my parents taught me that um, if there's someone who's been working all day at work, they're probably tired, so you should let them sit down and you should stand up. So most of the time, I was standing this entire way, there and back. Um, and this was every day except Saturday. So the only day I saw my house was on Saturday. Um, we would go to school there every day, and then we would um, go to their mass again on Sunday. And so. This is why, now that I'm a priest, I appreciate those of you who travel a long way for the Latin Mass, because I've been there, I've done it, and I probably travel longer and further than any of you. Um, so that's why I want to make the Mass available. That's why I will go uh, far away to, to celebrate the Mass on a Sunday, because uh, I've been there. Anyway, so high school, um, they didn't have a high school, the SSPX. So we, uh, so I was, I, I was, I managed to get into the most prestigious school in Sydney, St. Gregory's College. Um, when we made the application, uh, my mother put on the application that we, we, we were with the SSPX, and so we were, we were rejected, I was rejected. But then the priest that was setting up the parish near our house put in a good word for me, and so they, they ended up accepting me. And while I was there, my mother said, well, you know, um, there's this other school in Kansas. Do you want to go to that? And I was just like, why would I want to go to Kansas? <laughs> and uh, she said, well, Greg's going. So I'm like, oh, well, I like Greg. He's my best friend. Sure, I'll go. Apparently, Greg's mother had the same conversation with him. And he said, why would I want to go to Kansas? And she said, well, James is going. So he's like, OK, I'll go. <laughs> so Greg and I went to Kansas. And it was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, hasn't changed much. Um, and we went to this school. And then 1988 happened. So in 1988, there were dialogues with Rome, and Archbishop Lefebvre wanted to consecrate bishops, and Rome said yes, and then Rome said no, and then there was a signing, and then there was a retraction, and then there was all this stuff going on, and then it ended up that Archbishop Lefebvre said, I'm going to consecrate four bishops, and Rome said, if you do that, we're excommunicating you, and he said, I don't care, and it all happened, and then like from one day to the next, all these young priests that were saying the Latin Mass were like kicked out of the Catholic Church. So uh, the sky is falling. 
So we had these old priests that were celebrating the Mass, and these young priests come in, and then they're all excommunicated, and uh, what happens next? Luckily, I had an escape card. And the escape card was that I always wanted to be a priest. When I was a little kid, before my first communion, I wanted to be a priest. I wanted to be a Jesuit. But then by this time of seeing these old priests celebrating the Mass and loving the Mass, and they've got something that they want to give, and they're carrying this torch that they need to hand on, I was like, well, I want to carry that torch. So I want to do the Latin Mass. And so so happened to be that this monastery where my sister and my brother went, they did the Latin Mass there. So I decided to, to join them. I figured, well, my brother and sister are there. They're doing the Latin Mass. I'm going to go check them out. So I went down to Mexico. And I was very young. I hadn't finished high school. I was 15. And... Uh, the superior said, well, you can visit now and you can come back when you're 20-something or you can stay now if you want and just finish your school here. So I was like, well, I mean, the sky just fell. All the priests got kicked out of the Catholic Church. I mean, I'm staying here. So this monastery, there's some sort of joke that they say that God doesn't know how many Franciscans there are. Um, so this was a different branch of the Franciscans. It was a new branch, but not so new. It was, it was founded in 1930, and it was diocesan right. So what that means is that a local bishop decides to set up a religious order, and if it works, great. If they build more houses in different uh, dioceses, then they can apply to Rome and get a pontifical right monastery. Um, but otherwise, it's just a diocesan right. It's a thing for the bishop. He can decide if it exists, if it doesn't exist. That's kind of how this thing was. Um, they had an old priest there. And the old priest played the card that all the other old priests played, that I'm too old to learn the new Mass. Can I keep saying the Latin Mass? And they said, yes, yeah, sure, whatever. You're in this monastery with 10 monks. Who cares? So, um, and then there was another priest who was a Trappist, and he wanted to say the Latin Mass only, and believe it or not, in a Trappist monastery, they didn't let him, even though Trappists don't talk and they don't look at each other, but for some reason he wasn't allowed to say Latin Mass, so he ended up joining this monastery too. And then the first one died, and by the time I got there, there was this other priest uh, still celebrating the Latin Mass, Father Athanasius. Um, I learned a lot from Father Athanasius. He was, he was kind of like your grandfather priest. He was, all, he was big and he was cuddly and <laughs> friendly. and, and uh, He really couldn't walk that well anymore, so he would like shuffle everywhere. And they had big slippers for him, so he would just shuffle around and, with these slippers. And people would come to the door of the monastery all day long ring the doorbell. Hey, can we have confession? Hey, can you bless my cross? Hey, can, uh, whatever. Can I have Holy Communion? Whatever. And his office was on the other side of the monastery, so all day long you would see him shuffling from his office to the front door and back again from, his, uh, from the front door back to his office and blessing these things and, well, it killed him. Um, And his last words were, there is still hope. And what he meant by those words, there is still hope, there's still hope that I can get better and stay alive and keep celebrating this Mass for you. That's what he meant. But he died. <laughs> and uh, I remember at his wake, I'm thinking, can't you just like rise from the dead because we need a priest? <laughs> And no, he died. So um, we're there and we don't have a priest. And we're in this monastery and like, so what do you do? So we, um, we went down the street. There was another priest, surprisingly close to us. And he said mass in, in a little room upstairs. And uh, we went to his mass and... 
After the Mass, he said something in Spanish, and then I didn't speak Spanish very well. It took me like 10 years to learn Spanish. Um, and then we come back from there, and the brothers are saying, we're never going there again. I was like, why? What's going on? And they said, well, he said that we're going to pray that Cardinal Watoya doesn't come to Mexico for his visit. In other words, he was a set of Acantis. And this was my first experience of set of Acantis. Basically, they are um, people who believe that there is no Pope. Now, there's different groups of set of Acantis. I'm all experiencing this for the first time at this moment in my life. And at, when I was in the monastery there, I was like, well, what are these guys? And that, no, they don't believe there's a Pope and that uh, there hasn't been a Pope. There's two different groups. There's ones that believe there hasn't been a Pope since, I think it was like, Pius IX, and the other one believes that there hasn't been a pope since Pope John the Twenty-Third. But either way, so there's no pope. Um, so, so we cross that off because I mean they're obviously not Catholic. They don't believe that there's a pope. So, so what did we do? Well, we knelt at the altar rail and we pulled out a missile and we just prayed the prayers of the mass out of the missile and called it a day. And then the next day we did the same thing. It was, I've been there. It's hard. And then we found Father Placidus. It wasn't too long. It's like a couple weeks. We found this priest. Father Placidus was a Benedictine from Mount Angel Abbey. And he was down in Mexico at a priory down there. Didn't speak a word of Spanish. And he would only celebrate the Latin Mass. Ever since Mount Angel, he just continued celebrating the Latin Mass. That's what he did. He had a, he had a spot in the sacristy. They, they didn't even give him a proper altar. They just basically let him be on the cabinet there in the sacristy, and he celebrated Mass in the sacristy. Um, and they would get great pleasure out of hiding his stuff. So one day he wouldn't have an altar card, or one day he wouldn't have a candle, or one day he wouldn't have the missile, or one day, one thing after another, they would just hide his stuff, so it would be really impossible for him to celebrate Mass, and God bless him, he survived, he made it through. So um, he would actually celebrate two Masses every day. And I asked him, I said, well, Father, why do you celebrate two Masses every day? And he would say, well, it's like hobbling around on one leg. But um, the reason why he celebrated two Masses every day was because he did one Mass for whatever it was, the Mass of the day. And then he would do the second Mass in reparation for what he would call the Gang Mass. So um, if you go to an old Benedictine monastery like uh, Faucambeau, and you get there early in the morning and you go into the church, it's an amazing sight to see. Because you've got like 100 monks and about 90 of them are priests. And um, at that time in the morning, all the priests celebrate Mass. But it's not one Mass, it's 100 Masses. So there's like 100 altars in the church and it's all dark lit with little candles and then you've got like the, the priests all come out all, all together, and each of them file off to their little altars, and they celebrate Mass, and they've got an altar server, and um, it's fascinating to see that it's just like, there's nothing like it. But then when concelebration happened, they all just celebrated Mass together. So all those Masses that used to be celebrated didn't happen anymore, and everybody just gathered around the altar and celebrated one Mass. And so Father Placidus didn't like the gang Mass, everybody, all the gang getting together to celebrate Mass. <laughs> so he would do one Mass for himself, and then one Mass in reparation for the gang Mass, that he would call it. <laughs> so he agreed to come to the monastery and, and be our chaplain, and his superiors gave him permission to go there, and uh, so we had, we had Mass again. And all this while in the monastery, um, I was studying because I really wanted to be a priest. There was a time when I was studying to finish my schoolwork. 
because I joined the monastery before I finished high school, and then I went on to theology and philosophy, and we had all the manuals there. We had an excellent library and just studying it. I was studying it by myself, and my brother was kind of studying too. And so the superior, who was a brother, um, but he, was, he knew his theology, he said, you know what, I'm going to teach you guys so you can start learning to, to become a priest. So we were studying. In the mornings we would work, and then in the afternoons we would just study and study and study. And there was this old brother there. Uh, Brother Bernardino, and he sees us studying, and he's like, you know, uh, I mean, the part that I'm missing out is that there was no bishop on the horizon who would be ordaining us, because there's so few priests celebrating Mass as it is. Who's going to ordain us? But we're studying there as best we can with hopes that something someday would happen. And Brother Bernardino comes in and he's like, you know, you keep studying because God will open the doors and the windows. I remember him saying that very clearly because I was thinking to myself, why would he open a window? <laughs> Just open the door. But anyway, he said that. And, and um, so we're studying there and Father Placidus is our chaplain and... and uh, some guy came to the monastery, he turns out he's a bishop, and he's like, um, I'll ordain you for 10 grand. <laughs> like, what? So we find out that like, there's these bishops that ordain for money. Like, so there's this took line, so there's this bishop in, I believe it was some island country, and um, he wasn't that well in his head and he started ordaining people and he realized, oh, I shouldn't be doing this, or consecrating bishops. And he's like, oh, I shouldn't do this. So he went back to Rome and he repented. And, uh, but then these bishops got out and they started consecrating other bishops and other priests. And uh, they would do it for money. Like this guy was like, well, if you can't afford 10 grand, I can do you a minor order for one grand. <laughs> It's like, no, we don't want illicit orders here. We're fine. We're good. Thank you. There's the door. Get out. <laughs> and uh, turns out there's, there's all these bishops around. And uh, we're finding out in Mexico that there's this, I never found out more details about it, but apparently in the, in the countryside in Mexico, there's this, group of priests that the guy thinks he's Pope and he ordains like 700 priests and they say hundreds of masses every day because they think that, but these are like a married man or whatever, he just like ordains them all and uh, completely messed up. But anyway, we're doing our studies and then Father Placidus falls off a ladder and uh, he's out cold, like he's, he's, he busted his back. And uh, my brother and I are looking at ourselves and we're like, just, this is bad. This is very bad. Um, the last priest on earth just <laughs> got a back injury. Um, so we're talking to the superior and we're just like, hey, we got to do something about this. Come on. Like, we're studying here, but like, we got to do something right to get ordained because we need priests. And the superior is just like, okay, what are you going to do? I say, well, we're going to go to the diocese and ask him. And he's like, okay, go for it. So we went to the archdiocese and uh, we spoke to the vicar of religious and he was just like, well, why don't you join the seminary? And we're like, we can do that as Franciscans? He's like, yeah, sure. There's other religious in the seminary too. Actually, I think you should join the Jesuits because uh, they have a 20 year program. <laughs> in other words, I don't want to ordain you, but just. So we joined the seminary and uh, we did our philosophy in the seminary, and then, oh, so we go back to Father Placidus. He's there on his bed, <laughs> poor guy. And uh, we're like, hey, Archdiocese has given us permission to go to the seminary. We'll be priests in seven years. Can you live another seven years? <laughs> God bless him. He said yes. <laughs> and he got up out of bed and he lived another seven years. Yeah. Yeah, he died after I was ordained. 
Um, so when the world ended and all the young priests got kicked out of the Catholic Church, apparently there was a group of priests, like a handful of them, that went to the Pope and that the Pope started this congregation. And we had heard, we, we heard about it in 88, and we were told by everybody who tells anybody anything that this was a scam from Rome, that these guys were going to be forced to say the new mass, that it wouldn't last, that whatever, the little few priests, whatever, and don't worry about them, nothing's gonna happen. Well, anyway, it turns out that these priests start a seminary in the United States. So yeah, back then, yeah, it was like one priest in the United States, hey, I'm gonna start a seminary. Um, but they did, they started a seminary in the United States and, and it was right about the time when my brother and I were going into theology. And we were concerned about the quality of the theology in the Archdiocese and Seminary. And we're like, well, we, we really don't wanna go through that if we don't know what we're being taught, how will we know if it is right or if it is wrong, or, or how will we know the truth? Like philosophy is one thing, but theology, that's something else. So we made plans to go to the Fraternity of St. Peter's Seminary um, in Pennsylvania at the time and do our seminary there. So we did. And uh, so that was interesting. That was, it was a, uh, it was an old hotel on a lake. Very, very charming. We used to call it the last resort. <laughs> <laughs> Go into the, the dining room and there's sheets of plastic, like plastic bag sheets of plastic, that are channeling the water into buckets when it rained from the roof. Um, it had a swimming pool on the first floor, but we weren't allowed to use the swimming pool because it was a fire hazard. <laughs> swimming pool, fire hazard, whatever. Um, and the fuse would blow all the time, so one of these seminarians had to climb out of his bed in the middle of the night in the freezing cold and go out and find the fuse and fix the fuse. Anyway, so it was an interesting place. It wasn't necessarily like the cavalry had come. It was more like, okay, well, we're making this happen. <clears throat> so my brother and I are there and it gets time for some minor orders. So we're like, okay, well, now how do we get ordained? So we go back to the Archdiocese of Love, because um, we couldn't be ordained with the fraternity because we weren't under the fraternity. We were under Mexico City Archdiocese, so it had to come from Mexico City Archdiocese. They could do the ceremony, sure, but we needed to get the permission from the Archdiocese of, of Mexico City. So we go to the Archdiocese of Mexico City and we speak to the minions that, that speak to people. And um, we're like, hey, uh, we're, we're kind of coming up on our, on our minor orders to get ordained. And they're like, you guys are getting ordained? And uh, we're like, yeah. And they're like, well, you know, let me get back to you on that. And they got back to us. They, they said, you know, the Cardinal of Mexico has decided to terminate your experiment. And we're like, what? It's like, they're shutting you down. And they're like, what do you mean they're shutting you down? Like, we have a monastery, there's all this stuff. And they're like, well, divvy up the stuff in the monastery among you and, and go your own ways, do whatever you want, but the monastery is no longer. So my brother and I were just like, whoa, uh, this is bad. Um, so we decided to go join the cavalry and we joined the fraternity of St. Peter. And um, it's basically been uphill ever since then. So that's kind of my story. So I've seen like the second generation, all these old priests who were like carrying the torch with their last dying breath and they needed to pass it on to someone. And uh, that's why I celebrate the Latin Mass, because it's beautiful, because it's a treasure of the church that was stolen from us, and that these priests were carrying this torch like 
until their dying breath. And they want to pass it on to someone. And uh, I want to take that torch now, and I want to light the world on fire with it. So, so that's kind of my story. There's one more chapter. And uh, we haven't lived it yet. But it's going to be a good one. When I was a kid, I heard about the cathedral in Los Angeles being built. Everybody heard about the cathedral in Los Angeles being built all over the world. The next chapter is that the whole world is going to hear about the church that's going to be built in Los Angeles for the Latin Mass. So it's kind of full circle. The fire almost died, and now the world's getting lit on fire again. That's, that's my story. That's all I got.